Well, we're back for part B of episode six. I know, I know, I promised a short one in the intro of the first part, but I was wrong. Uh, honestly, I didn't think we'd have this much to say, but we did. Uh, we also got some great viewer questions coming up from the community. They're deep, interesting to talk about. But before we get to them, and also because we're recording this episode, uh, I guess the break of the episodes after the initial recording, we've gotten some important news. Uh, Titan Masters Attack has had its release date officially moved back by Wizards of the Coast. They've done a similar thing uh, with the next expansion for Magic the Gathering. Uh, the Wave 5 of the Transformers TCG was originally supposed to release on April the 17th, but it's now set to debut in stores on May the 29th. I know that some people were anxiously awaiting the release to get their hands on the cards, but this way allows for the possibility of a real release event at your local store. It also relieves some stress from the departments involved in getting product out, uh, who may have been affected due to the circumstances of the world during this time. Anyway, we still got plenty of fun stuff for you guys in store, so without further ado... I have summoned you here for a purpose. Transformyourgame.net All right. Well, this week we have our first official segment of viewer questions. Thanks to a successful Facebook post that just went up today. Uh, so if you there, dear listener, find that you have something you want to ask us for next week's episode... Go ahead and lay it on us in a comment or a direct message in case you want to remain uh, anonymous during it. Which brings me to our first question. Uh, so Tyler Whitehead asked us in the post. He actually has two questions. So we'll address each of them individually. But the first question was, what battle card from the new set I find to be the most impactful on current meta decks? actually feel that it's belligerence by a, a wide margin. That card is... It, it feels like it's like the death nail for blue for a while. I I feel that this card is more impactful than press the advantage. And I understand like where they were going with it. Orange needed something to crack the shell of blue. First we crack the shell, then we crack the nuts inside. But I think this goes too far and I, I cannot stand playing with it or against it because it just feels like an oops, I win button. And I, I think I said this when we uh, were talking about it in one of the first podcasts um, as one of the spoilers. You're going to you're going to pay money. You're going to fly across the country to go to a tournament. And you're going to sit down like maybe you're playing blue and your opponent is playing blue and you're going to sit down and it'll you'll either have it main deck or you'll both certainly have it when it's sideboard time and after the match you're going to lose or or they are and you're going to walk up to you know your your buddy or your teammate and say well he drew his belligerence i didn't draw mine and that's what's going to decide games a lot of games and that is that completely takes the skill out of the game it just feels like it it's so luck based and there are like other ways to draw it in case you like espionage it out of your opponent's hand or counter espionage it out of your opponent's hand well maybe they're playing pocket processor or perceptor or you know they have other ways to draw it again you know, or they just luckily top decked it again. That has that. There's no skill involved with like luck, lucky top deck. I feel like most battle cards in the game, if you have a lucky top deck, it's not like it just ends the game or swings it so hard that it almost ends the game. I'm, yeah. I, I, everyone on this team knows like my hatred of this card. It's one of the only misses that I think Wizards has ever printed. And yeah, yeah, just I I actually think that this might get banned um, not anytime soon, but maybe right before EI. If, if we get to have an EI <laughs> this year with the crazy circumstance that the entire world is under right now. Online qualifiers. Uh, yeah, online <laughs> qualifiers. I really hope that there's something like that. I really, truly, and passionately do. Um, I love this game so much. Uh, but I feel like it's meta warping 
And it's just, I don't think it's a good card for the game. I think they should have made something similar, but not so powerful to help orange kind of crack the shell around blue. Okay. So if we're to answer the question as verbatim, then I think all of us should be answering belligerence. That card is crazy, but for the sake of just giving a different answer, I'm going to say hold the line and technically villainous spotlight, but I'm going to go more into hold the line. Um, hold the line is, that card is going to impact not just air, air strike mirrors, but like aggro mirrors in general. Like if you, if you're not, pl- if you're not siding into your multiple copies, then you're in for a bad time, dude. This, this card is crazy because even if it just had the, it can't take more attack damage than the stars of the attacker. That part is crazy already, but e- even just as a generic heal one secret action is still pretty solid. So, <laughs> yeah, it's and it's green pip. It's a green pip secret action that's incredibly relevant in an aggro metagame. That, which is what I believe most people are predicting to be this game's format for the next set. So yeah, hold the line and villain the spotlight exacerbating that. I think, yeah, those will card those cards will be incredibly impactful. Well, his uh, his question was to be the most impactful on current meta decks. So if anybody has listened to this podcast, they know where I'm going to go with this. I think that the, I mean, besides belligerence, all right, that the obviously most impactful card out of three, three of including every deck is going to be lucky dodge. Um, <laughs> that card is absolutely. I was wondering where you were going to go with that. <laughs> wait a second. Oh, wait. So I think that would impact <laughs> current meta decks the most. I'm, I'm going to cheat and say two cards. Um, Nitro Booster is an obvious, obvious, awesome card in one of the strongest decks in the meta right now, the orange-black deck. Um, it goes great on a Demolisher. It goes great on Lionizer. Vanguard. It goes great on... Well, it goes great on those guys. It fits in there with the Black Pip. It, it's fantastic. It gives you an untap. The, the other card that is that would obviously impact that deck would be Magnetic Dysfunction Ray. That's a super strong card. It's got the orange and the black pip included already. So either of those cards, if you just you could just auto include three copies of that in one of those decks, it would be an improvement right away. Before we go into the next question, uh, quick answer: Belligerence. Duh. Oh my gosh, Belligerence. For the sake of giving another card that I think will be impactful on current decks is going to be counter espionage. I think counter espionage it's not going to be three ofs in decks, but I think it's a pretty easy one of. It's got relevant pips. It's a green. Um, you can scrap sabotage armaments. You can scrap in fortifications. You can scrap heroic resolves. You can scrap hold the lines, right? Like I think it's a really good way to fight. Help you fight combo. Baker. Once they fill their hand on like one of the earlier turns and they're trying to build up before they go off, you can hit all of their copies of equipment enthusiasts or brainstorm out of their hand, right? Like there's a there's a lot of potential applications for it there. It is a good way to counteract belligerence, believe it or not. Like I think you can actually it's not the it's not a guarantee, but it is a way to help ensure that you're not going to lose the game to that card. Um, I really like counter espionage. It's been very effective, particularly against me. Um, because I like to draw cards, so I often have lots in my hand. That's my answer to that question. But Tyler also asked us, what Titan Master did y'all find to be the one you wanted to play around with the most? And I, I don't know that he he like specified head or body or a combination of the two. But uh, I if, asked him, and it, it was combination. Okay, what combination then? Um, for me, I think I'm gonna pick the obvious one here. It's just Fangry and Parsec. Just seven bold three. Seven drop for both three is ridiculous. Just <laughs> that's a straight upgrade from barrage in most circumstances. So and barrage, you can't even get that turn one when it's most effective. So Fangri, I've been fitting Fangri and Parsec in a lot of decks that I've been making for sure. Yeah, Fangri's going to see a lot of play. The 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 combo that I was most interested in uh, is the inner Timmy and me. I, I really wanted to play Fangri with Clobber so that I could have bold five, or if I play it in a blaster deck, bold six on turn one if if, uh, if you're playing the right mini cassette. So I think that sounds like a lot of fun. I, I've, I've really, really 
wanted to so much fun. Want, want to play. Yeah, no, it is so much fun. Bolt six. Who doesn't like bolt six? Come on, bolt six and, and a free belligerence off the top. I mean, that sounds like that sounds like um, game. It sounds like game. <laughs> Uh, for me, it's Fortress Maximus uh, with Cerebros and Flintlock. The Flintlock may change to whatever Tough 2 head that they reveal, because uh, they still haven't revealed that one. Maybe to get the heroic spotlight going with Fortress Maximus. Anyway, Fortress Maximus is one of my favorite characters He's really cool in the the Marvel comics as well as the IDW comics. He's also the largest Transformer ever made, toy wise, which is really cool. Until at least Unicron comes out say, until next. Unicron. Yeah, which I've ordered two of that, so I'm I'm really excited about Unicron finally after like a zillion years waiting for a toy version of that. Anyways, I love his abilities. I actually believe that. Cerebros is the focal point of that deck, uh, not Fortress Maximus. Fort Max gets to do some, you know, cool stuff early on, but then Cerebros' ability to just, like, pick up stuff and wear them is crazy. And giving him tough four when you add Flintlock, it's just like, okay, pick up whatever you want out of your scrap and put it on him. And whether that's a medic's protective field or a master sword or an escape capsule. So all the upgrades are going to go on to Flintlock when Cerebros eventually dies. And, you know, hey, Flintlock with a master sword and a medic's protective field. And then the escape pod, he's swinging for nine right there. I mean, so it, it feels like that deck every time a head pops off like if it's built correctly it can just like really hit pretty hard every single little piece of it there's still a lot of work to do with that deck but i feel that it's very very intriguing my cheater answer is sky shadow because technically that is a body head combination once you combine them but uh, my actual answer, the one I'm most excited to play with, is just horrible in any of the health heads. Whether it's Kreb or Briscoe or Grax, I have loved playing horrible, and I think he's costed in a way, star-wise, where you can kind of really fit him into whatever team you want. It's He's small enough that you can play alongside all four of a p- patrol's members. He's just big enough that he could be a 9 or 10 star character. He's the extra bonus damage you get out of his bot mo- or his body mode ability is just it's really cool and it just changes the flow of the game right like you're kind of threatening to KO bots in places or in spots of the game that no other character really lets you do which is really awesome um i just i feel like i've loved having the power of that dude, character <clears throat> dude i'm so ashamed of myself i didn't i somehow blanked on horrible and when i was the one who was the most excited about him when we were talking about him <laughs> i am ashamed of my words and deeds <laughs> it's okay because uh <laughs> don't worry I, I covered him oh which reminds me somehow we haven't mentioned the word extra padding yet in this episode so I just go ahead and get that in there extra padding <laughs> extra padding extra padding uh, <laughs> extra padding <laughs> we're gonna talk about it in one of the questions all right all right we'll get there too it, why not mention it more times it wants more copies of itself okay <laughs> we're gonna move on to the next question which is another two-parter believe it or not um from nick weidman which i hope i pronounced that last name correctly and please correct me if i didn't nick um but he says that he's curious to hear if we've tested with Sky Shadow, and if so, do we have any thoughts on what might be the best way to play him? So I have tested a lot with Sky Shadow. I mentioned in the last question that Sky Shadow is kind of my favorite um, Titan Master head-body combo that I'm going to play with. Only having to spend 15 stars to basically get a 17-star character and an extra attack has just been it's been wild. And the fact that the guy is so is he he's literally zero flips are invested in the building and the, and the like progressing of the character that he's ranged he's got reasonable stats in in both modes like he's just he's just better on so many axes than so many other characters um at the star cost as far as what the best way to play him 
Man, I don't know. I thought it was blue for a while. I was experimenting with certain different blue decks, like characters that want to flip there. And then uh, I got beat down by just the plane out of a bold deck. And I was like, oh, you don't have to play him. You can play him in the individual parts. Like, I didn't even think about that. And then I was playing against my buddies uh, locally, and we were talking together about a 13-7-5 deck with, like, Octone and Flame War and the tank just as, like, a 4-10-2 tough two. And I was like, that is a – it's a beefy boy, and it gives you all the flexibility in the world to transform your Octone at will, which I think is pretty awesome. I don't know what the best way to play him is. Honestly, <laughs> I don't know if it's orange. I don't know if it's blue. Um, I know he helps you find, like, or I, I mean, like, I know he helps you find, like, all the blue pips you could ever want, and Pierce 4 is super real. I'm excited, but I don't know what the best way to play him is. So I have two decks, and I'm just kind of in the alpha stages of working with, and that is both Pieces of Sky Shadow and Six Gun. Something about like being able to put both the weapons of Six Gun, you know, when he eventually dies onto Sky Shadow. It, I mean, that's really pretty appealing to me. Um, but the other one that I think might be better is playing a blue black with Deadlock. Now, Deadlock in alt mode has stealth against Autobots and Decepticons. And now you also get access to opportune offensive. So, you know, you can have three bigger they are's, three opportune offensives, and the rest of the cards are either blue or black or both. And I think that there's a lot of Pierce to be had um, with that team. And the fact that, like, you're going to combine really fast because deadlock has stealth whether he's tapped or not um i think that could be a really powerful combination yeah i only played with i've only actually played with sky shadow just a little bit out of like when the set was first revealed and he was very powerful uh swinging with him with heavy handed and energy on axe was pierce 10 that was fun <laughs> yeah. um but yeah it's i've kind of just left sky shadow to you guys but i will say he is a freaking menace against <laughs> against blue. Like if <laughs> if he combines at an inopportune time, you probably lost the game. Like the other day, I was playtesting with Richard, and <laughs> I swung into the tank, and the tank only blocked two, and I was swinging for a lot, and then he combined, and I'm like, oh, I guess I lose. <laughs> I flipped like I flipped like um, enforcement batons. Uh, I flipped like, um, oh, what else did I flip? I flipped like a reprocess. It was like one or then, two hiding spots, and I was like, oh, okay, I guess I yeah. lose. Yeah, I more than playing hiding spot in the deck. I, I, flipped, I flipped like no blues, and you like swung into it and KO'd him from, I think he had three damage on him. You like dealt him seven, yeah. KO'd yeah. him like mind, and you're like, well, that's it. And I was like, yes, I guess my, I guy, my guy got <laughs> KO'd, yay. <laughs> yeah, he is very good. He is very good for sure. <laughs> yeah, I personally have not done any playtesting with him at all. Uh, the The place that I would start, since he's going to be centered around Pierce, uh, the Pierce 4 when he combines, would be to put him with someone like Horrible and a head like Grax so that so that Horrible has a lot of life and, and make, it a, make it about a blue Pierce deck um, because he has... The bold, so that you can get the you can get the extra pierce. He already has the native pierce four with the head and and bold two with his eight power, so he could get some get some extra pierce in there. And so horrible is dealing a lot of damage. That's where I would start. All right. Well, let's move on to Nick's second question, uh, which was how do games involving Titan Masters, the the heads, I think is what he's specifically talking about, feel or play differently to us? Well, for me. It is such an interesting mechanic. I really love so many things about this set, minus belligerence. And <laughs> it, it just changes the game so much where you're actually playing wider than you normally would. And, you know, getting that extra, it's not just an extra character that you get to swing with. But it's also an extra draw, an extra action, an extra upgrade. That's really, really relevant and can even be game swinging. 
a lot of these guys are really fun to play with. I know when I first saw the Titan Masters, I was like, ah, I just don't know that they're that good. Oh, I am a believer now. They are very, very strong. So I've I've been playing a lot against uh, these guys specifically, and uh, I, I've miscounted how wide they actually are because I swung into Fangry. I'm like, okay, kill them, and then you're still three wide, and I'm like, oh, are, all right, <laughs> snap, <laughs> and, and yeah, it's, me too. It, yeah, it's it's happened to <laughs> many of us many a times, and it's definitely something you have to acclimate to for sure. Yeah, but yeah, it's it's a different feeling, and it is powerful. So. Yeah, what, what the Titan Masters seem like they do is they, they take a lot of the a lot of the bonus that you would get from say like a Cars deck during Wave One or whenever you're using Turbo Boosters and and Starter Engines and and just getting those extra turns because you get to keep on tapping guys. It's almost like that uh, because the the team continues to stay the same size even when someone gets knocked out. Preserving width in aggressive decks is really awesome. I think it might be able to. You know, lend a real hand to three wide aggro decks, which we kind of saw the death of in Wave 4, and then, which stinks because they were really cool and they kind of dominated Wave 3. I think the most interesting thing about the Headmasters is that I feel like just, they can just be so weirdly disruptive. There's this concept in a lot of competitive card games called Tempo, and I may have been, been on this high horse before in this podcast, I'm not sure, but in Transformers, because of the fact that uh, there's so little that you get to do on your opponent's turn interaction-wise. Um, I don't know that Tempo has been a particularly relevant resource to calculate, and it's kind of like the number of resources per turn you're ahead of your opponent by, right? So like, I think um, attacks are kind of like the biggest way that Tempo has been realized in the game. Titan Masters and the heads popping off is the first real defensive. Basically, like there's not a whole lot of ways to defensively engage in the advancement or progression of resources on your side of the field on your opponent's turn. And this is one, and I really like it. I feel like the games that have had Headmasters involved with them, I feel like I'm calculating more turns ahead in the future. I don't know if y'all feel the same way, because I know there's going to be an extra body there. It's going to change my attacks. Uh, I might have to – maybe I'll sandbag a sturdy javelin that could otherwise be a really good play because I know I'm just going to want to use it to take out an attack by KOing a very small character with it down the line. Like that's the kind of stuff that's going on in my head, and I really liked it. I don't I, – I, I like the mix and match, deck building portion of it. I really like the way the game flow is changed by it. Huge fan, and I wasn't a believer necessarily at the outset. So – they, they won me over. Well, I think we'll move on to uh, our next question, which comes from Sean Hamilton. He's wondering which of the Titan Master head-body combinations do we each think has the potential to change the meta? I guess so as opposed to being like ones that really kind of like got your creative juices flowing, which ones do you think are like, wow, this card is going to be around? Well, for me, I, I I think that Perceptor is going to make a really really big impact. It's a super skill based card. Um, if if Blue can survive Belligerence, then Perceptor is going to definitely have a place because he he can have a he can have a really big body uh, with a, with a lot of defense if you're using Flintlock. So he and Flintlock would be the combination that I'm talking about here. Uh, built in tough three. Flipping him over and over, drawing lots and lots of cards, or making him huge, or both, and then by the time you get to swing with him, he, he's he's just a monster to deal with. And you can protect him by putting smaller bots around him that can take the brunt of the attack up front. All right, who else is surprised that Joel did not say Fangry plus Dude, any other me. head? Oh my gosh, I thought... <laughs> oh. Oh, oh, I think Fangry might see the most play of, of any of the Titan Masters. However, I think the one I don't think that Fangry is going to be uh, meta defining. I think that, that someone like Perceptor right away is going to be everywhere. Meta-defined. Fangry will be the most fun to play. I'm not I'm not arguing with you there. <laughs> <laughs> How about you, Kai? I think we are going to see uh, Fangry do quite a lot. I think Clobber is going to do a lot. Even if belligerence wasn't a thing, I think Blue would probably still have a hard time just because of Sky Shadow. Sky Shadow is just insanely strong against a Blue deck, so it's, I, I think if Sky Shadow were to exist in the way for meta, I think we would have a vastly different metagame than we do now. For me, it's horrible with any head that kind of boosts up his life. I think
But as this meta develops, I think that guy's going to be totally everywhere. He's very, very strong and like, do not underestimate his ability of playing a black card and getting to do a damage to an enemy that adds up really, really quick. And then he just flips and moves a damage off of himself. Yeah, that that guy's really, really strong. Yeah, I mean, if you were to look at, you know, not that any of the viewers has this kind of purview, but if you were to get a peek into our collective Google Drive, you would see a lot of horrible decks. Good, horrible stuff. Yeah, we'd also, yeah, there'd also be decks with horrible in it, in addition to there being a bunch of horrible decks in there. Uh, yeah. uh, uh, hey, uh, hey, bad joke hey. number, was this like three <laughs> of the episode? Thank you, Kai. I'll be here all episode. <laughs> I guess as far as the actual question goes, <laughs> um, I would have to probably say horrible. Like, I think Fangry might be the most meta-defining, but um, but just because I think that it's so it's representative of what's going to be going on um, in the meta game. But I think that horrible is the the card that stands to carve out the most new archetypes, and so that is what I'm kind of choosing to use as the definition of meta-defining. For me, and I guess I would I would love to see him with Grax because all that HP plus his ability is fantastic. But we don't always get to fit that in our lineup. So I'm gonna go to the same answer as uh, my answer to the next question, which is you know horrible with any of the health heads. All right, well uh, we will move on to the next question, which is from Chris Logan. He threw this one out to us. What will it take to make the Boombox version of Soundwave playable? And that's not the exact way he asked it. But just for clarification's sake for the audience, we're talking about the one from the ancillary set that came with – that had its uh, partner Blaster. And I think we're going to toss it up to you guys first. I don't know. I've played a little bit around with him. I love his ability to just transform, deploy a cassette, and then basically discard a card out of your opponent's hand. I really feel like more cards that are both blue and black-based – to help get some pierce going with him because none of those guys are going to be swinging for the fences. Uh, none of his cassettes. I think Ravage is really cool because he has native pierce. Uh, Buzzsaw, you know, getting to not only play a, a blue weapon, but then getting to move it around as well is, is pretty powerful. I think we've seen uh, someone in our locals, Damien, uh, play this... Uh, Soundwave deck, and I think he played it with Nightbird, if I'm yes. thinking correctly, and then was able to play three bigger they are and three opportune offensive. And I think that was really, really powerful. I almost think that with some of the new black cards that they're printing, and the again, the black and blue together uh, cards, it could see some like meta play i feel like there just wasn't enough pierce before and i feel like that deck's goal should be to knock down your opponent's hand to nothing so it needs espionage and counter espionage in addition to the sound wave flips and then it needed some really strong blue cards which it uh energon mace helps that uh quite a bit so we shall see. I, I'm i not ready to discount that deck yet. The main problem with this deck specifically is that it's all the cassettes doing the work. They get to play bigger they are. They get to play opportune offensive. They get to play laser colors. So they're going for big damage. And then Soundwave is just the enabler. He just enables them to do the things. He doesn't actually do anything else. Taking a card out of your opponent's hand is negligible in that deck it, it doesn't do anything so it's it's honestly soundwave's fault that the deck hasn't <laughs> as as weird as that is to say it is soundwave's fault that the deck hasn't propelled itself into the metagame because he doesn't do anything he swings for four maybe six if you have the the scoundrel blaster maybe seven if he has energon axe but that's about it so i mean like he enables rec recovery cassette too which makes the cassettes even more insane but that's that's literally Soundwave's problem is himself, and I am sad. Yeah, I want to give a shout-out to my friend Damian Mayfield, who was playing that deck 
at uh, PPT Dallas. We played against each other in round five, and whichever one of us won that match was going to make top eight. He lost to me at time on a crummy, a kind of crummy rule. He he played recover cassette to put to put one of the cassettes back under Soundwave, and then time was called. And for whatever reason, the the life for that cassette doesn't count for the life total. So that's why I won that match and why I moved on to top eight instead of him. So I was really intrigued with his deck after we played. And, and uh, yeah, to go along with what Kai was saying, uh, Soundwave is kind of the, the weakness in that deck. I rebuilt that deck and tried it using Blaster instead of Soundwave just because uh, I thought that it would be it would be good to get the free cards instead of trying to make my opponent yeah, discard and- cards because that ability isn't nearly as relevant. And it, it worked really, really well, but it was super weak to, uh, to Octone, which was popular at the time because he would just flip and deal damage to something every single turn, which was super annoying. So, uh, yeah, I think the, the problem with Soundwave is... Soundwave's ability just really isn't super good. If if he had Blaster's ability, it'd be fantastic. Now, I'm not saying he has to be Blaster and then it would be an orange deck. I mean, like, it, it, it was a lot better with Blaster if he was a Decepticon. So the, his ability is what's holding him back, I think. The, the deck just wasn't as defensive as it needed to be. Just trying to chip at your opponent very slowly. Hey... Energon Axe or Laser Cutlass, like, hey, they're doing seven to nine to me and I'm doing three to them. It just felt like it. that's not enough. I had to have no experience with the deck that you guys have been talking about here. Um, I will say that the mini cassettes mechanic is something that is not done. Like, they have a full license to go back and print more mini cassettes. And they could absolutely print one for uh, for Soundwave that does that helps him out a lot more than it would help out Blaster. You never know, right? Like he could he could do something where he gives a buff to Decepticons. They could print um, a stratagem to go with Blaster and Soundwave, and maybe the Blaster one is better, or maybe the Soundwave one is better. But those are both things that are still on the table as far as things that could come in the future to help make the deck better. Um, as far as what is missing right now, I can't speak as much to it, but I can talk to you about like the mechanics that you know like might improve in the future. Um, we do have one last question, uh, and this one got in just under the wire. I mean, I didn't even uh, uh, Kai told me about this when we were like logging on to start recording. Uh, but Caleb Alker asked us, uh, and I hope I pronounced that right too. Last names are hard, man. Um, <laughs> names are hard. Names are hard. Uh, but Caleb asks us, uh, how do y'all initially feel about Jetfire and Galaxy Optimus from Wave 4 uh, moving forward into the Wave 5 metagame? Now, I know we probably have a lot of thoughts on this, but <laughs> we, could, we could probably like expand on this um, also in like our wrap-up of the Spoiler Season podcast. Yeah, a- absolutely. Um, so Richard and I... We're playing a lot of Jetfire Thrust in the last two major events of Wave 4. So when you say Jetfire, that's exactly how I imagine it. I don't really imagine it with Tailwind and Night Flight. Um, I honestly think that deck's probably dead in the water. Um, That deck could not in any way, no matter how we tried that deck cannot beat that orange black deck. I've tried many games uh, since Pro Play Tour Orlando made top eight and David knocked me out. And then I think he knocked out Richard with the same deck. And it's just that deck is only getting better. And I feel like the orange black is also now has a solid game with a totally different lineup as well. So I expect orange black to see a lot of play. And because of that, and you know, Jetfire thrust was one of my favorite decks that I've ever played, but I just think that decks basically deleted from the meta game at this point, galaxy Optimus, if it's three wide, I think is going to have a really, really tough time with orange black, but perhaps maybe if it sideboards correctly and changes the main deck up a little bit, maybe it can help prepare for that. 
Uh, so I actually think Jetfire is in the same spot as Shockwave is at uh, the beginning of Wave 4. People still play him, but the numbers will slowly dwindle because that, that deck, I don't think, really got anything that is evolving it to match up, keep it on pace with anything that we see in, the, in this game. Because too tall against a three-wide Titan Master deck, that might be a little rough, but... I don't know. I didn't really play Jetfire all too much. I actually played Galaxy Optimus more, and I think he's still going to be one of the best decks, especially one of the best blue decks for sure, because just being able to play Energy Packs or Matrixes for free is really the reason why you want to play that deck, because it makes all your little guys stronger and more relevant in attacking, and he just swings for eight immediately. So I think Galaxy Optimus will be the most successful blue deck to survive. Yeah, from the looks of things, uh, the the meta is going to get wider in general, but some of that could just be perceived to be wider, like uh, Kai was just saying with the three-wide type master. That's still just a three-wide deck that continues to stay three-wide, so it's not actually like a six-wide deck or something like that. Uh, so it, it won't be like four or five swings on Jetfire or Galaxy Prime every time he gets to swing once. So it, it won't be super out of balance like that. And I think that cards like Hold the Line are going to be really big players in helping guys like Galaxy Prime and Jetfire continue to combat wider lineups. The, the biggest thing is belligerence, too. It's just going to eat up all of your defense. And, yeah, you've got this great centerpiece character of galaxy optimus or Jetfire, and it's just gonna like knock off half their life so that that one card alone is gonna make it super difficult all right settle in boys i got <laughs> i got a soapbox all right i think that one of the things that you guys need to take into account when you're evaluating your wave four decks moving into wave five because thus far there are no plans for the Transformers TCG to be a rotating game or have a rotating format included within it, each new set is a proportionally smaller piece of the overall card pool. So what that means is the decks that existed before each subsequent set are more likely to persist because fewer cards will net will be added like percentage-wise to the card pool at each release which means that like fewer archetypes will emerge proportionally to what already exists. Jetfire is dead. Um, all of its incarnations are dead. And that makes me really sad to say because I played it at every major <laughs> event in 2019 uh, and to great success. And I talked a lot about it on the internet. Um, but the, the strength of that deck is its defense. It's not its health total. No matter which incarnation you're playing, like if you're playing Jetfire Thrust, your health your health total is uh, 31. If you're playing Jetfire with Aimless, your health total is 28. If you're playing the three wide version with Tailwind and with Night Flight, uh, if your health total is 35, and your defense on that one is lower, the, none of those is a particularly high health total, especially when it's all concentrated on one guy, and the fact that one of the things that Jeff Fire did uniquely was that he assembled extra paddings better than any other deck in the game. And Tough just is completely irrelevant in the face of belligerence. On top of that, Counter Espionage is a card that's also going to hurt the Jetfire deck. You can't assemble War of Attritions like you used to. <clears throat> On top of that, the fact that you were so good at drawing cards to, to make sure that you were able to continually play secret actions out of that out of Jetfire is uh, less valuable now because Counter Espionage it can disrupt that. So you're not going to be fully guarded against everything you need to be guarded against. There's just a lot more tools to interact with you, and you didn't get a whole lot. Jetfire in this set, from what I've seen, has gotten Hold the Line, Staggering Might, Master Sword, and Ghost Shield. And those are the only cards that I would play alongside him right now, and they aren't good enough. They're, they're cool. Um, Hold the Line is interesting, but if you're a defensive deck and you're having to play your action every turn just to not die from one character attack, that's just not it. Try and do something else different. Galaxy Prime is a different animal entirely. So the strength of Galaxy Prime was its HP, right? Because of the energy packs that you can put onto um, 
Galaxy himself. So he can get up to like an absolutely nasty health total across your team. On top of the fact that you actually get a strict upgrade from your second five-star slot in place of Skydive, you now get to play Night Racer. Night Racer is just better in that deck. More health, two defense base, can, can uh, double the tough anthem across your team if you're playing secret actions, and there are a lot of them that are going to be relevant. The fact that uh, – so here's the thing that I think is important that makes Galaxy Prime uh, able to stand up against belligerence, which is the fact that he can live through one. There's no guarantee that Jetfire is going to live through the first belligerence, at least not with any meaningful life total, and that's the problem. Because the odds that your opponent is going to be able to have one over the course of a game and it be an inopportune time are too high. The Galaxy Prime deck can beat one belligerence. It may not be able to beat two, but it can beat one, which means it has a chance against the aggressive decks. And it has a, de a chance against the other blue decks that are going to side in belligerence. So that deck will continue to be <clears throat> a part of the metagame. It will probably have to evolve. It's likely that its third character will change, and it may even like have to incorporate counter-espionage as another way to kind of like take out your opposing belligerences, right? I do think it won't be the absolute top dog. I think it'll be a top tier contender, but it won't be the absolute top dog where it kind of rested in the end of the 2019 season, I guess, like alongside uh, the Orange Black Pierce deck. So that's what I think about Jetfire Galaxy Optimus. You guys think I covered it? Yep. <laughs> <laughs> that's exactly how I feel. Okay. Um, well, that brings us to the end of the viewer questions portion of the show this week. We'd like to give a special shout-out to our friends of the cast that threw us some questions into the hat. We'd also like to thank you for listening, whether on YouTube, SoundCloud, iTunes, since we're now on the podcast portions there. Under transformyourgame.net, all one word, you can find us by searching just the first part, Transform Your Game, that'll also get you to us. I think we're also on Podcast Republic and Stitcher 2 now. Kai, you're kind of the manager of that, correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, so I didn't submit anything to Podcast Republic, but okay. I, I saw that we were on there, so I know one or two listeners listening on there, so if you could correct me on that, that'd be great, but I believe we are on both. Okay. Uh, on Stitcher specifically, you I haven't been able to found, find us by typing transform your game for some reason, but I have been able to find us at, through uh, Transformers TCG, so go go figure. Okay. All right. Yeah. Well, as long as it works, you know. Yeah. Um, the, the links will be in the description down below, so if you if you listen on any of those two, just get, just go in there. Yeah. If, it, if it's easier for you in the future to listen on some of those apps, like go ahead, check us out there. Um, that ought to do it for episode six. Uh, before we let you go, if you find the input information here valuable, you can find more strategy, analysis, tournament reports, and more like it at transformyourgame.net. Uh, like, subscribe, leave comments, and until next time, clear eyes, flip bots, can't lose. <laughs>